All right, Otto has a question. Please, please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks very much uh, uh, for your talk, for a wonderful talk. And uh, obviously the topics of biology are very close to my heart. So I'm gonna ask a question uh, based on that. And I think you started talking exactly about that towards the end of your talk, because you mentioned that you're sampling all around one fixed point. And it would be great to, to know a bit more in detail what happens in dynamics within the, the cell, be it yeast cell or whatnot. Uh, and to this point, I'm wondering, obviously the search space uh, would, would, would become enormous uh, if we talk about uh, really time resolved, uh, complex st uh, systems. Would it make sense to sort of use a little bit more um, of uh, you know published information about uh, pathways and and uh, regulatory networks uh, to regularize your search in a way. Um, I'm I'm not sure I understand your question correctly. What I was referring to on one of my last slides, uh, I think you meant you meant uh, this last last line here, huh? Mm -hmm. So the, the idea, what I how I presented the idea today was initially I said you are you are observing trajectories which in your state space, which apparently you don't know, but you guess it's in your state space near a stable fixed point. Okay, you just converge to a stable fixed point. Then in the second part of the first, part, the second, the last two slides of the first part of the talk. I showed that it's not necessary to have a stable fixed point or a fixed point at all, as long as you have any point in your state space near which you have trajectories which you observe. And that is unproblematic. The problematic comes, the problem comes in if you have if you say, okay, for this point, I have lots of trajectories nearby I can observe. And there's another point in state space here, I can also observe. And independently, like yeah, I could also construct from here and from there, but currently we cannot combine them. So it's about combining information from two different sites. So one challenge is if you can't reconstruct from here and you couldn't reconstruct from here, can you use the combination of both, maybe to make the data, suf data set sufficiently large to, um, to actually make progress? And we are currently at it. I can't. I can't say whether it will actually succeed. I believe yes. We are fighting for mm -hmm. it like five years, but but I think what you're asking is is more even another step, right? It's it's about how to determine which points to take. Is that correct? In a way, yes. Yeah. So I maybe another five years. I don't know. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are, are, are you in uh, Dresden? No, I uh, I'm usually based in Kansas currently on a home office, but oh, cool. Yeah. But yeah, but the other question, as I got it, was maybe if you know something from the pathways that may help exactly set up already yeah. Yeah. a priori the lambda matrices here. So, yes. so if you know so, that, that's you, nice. Yeah, it if can, you if you can can generate a lot of zeros in in these whole exactly. lambda matrices which came up in in this this approach, which somehow model the interaction, then this helps, of course, a lot for getting this block sparsity somehow yeah. already a likelihood of this from not only data driven, but only from knowledge, right? Yes, so exactly. What, yeah. Yes, exactly. So what, what this, that's completely right. But Michael would say, um, you would, where is it? You yeah. would just kill, you would kill some dimensions of C, right? You would make your problem simpler. If you know some of them are zero, you put them to be zero. That is not a problem. If you have the knowledge of certain independency, or if you have the knowledge of at least uh, on a long range, this interaction is suppressed so that, yes. that you can put it to zero. Then, actually, you can, then you can do a lot of zeros in these lambda matrices. And it's actually a common actual setting. Like many of, well, for example, in a gene regulatory network, maybe you know better than me, but some of the interactions are known to be present. Some of the interactions are known to be not present. Still most of the interaction pairs, the possible interaction pairs in larger regulatory networks are not known today. So in this sense, you can construct, like reduce your problem space 
by setting some of them to be zero and some of them to be not to force them to be non zero. I, but depending for at least you can set some of them to be zero, reducing the dimensionality of and, and to whatever the speed of the algorithm and so on. Ah, well, maybe of practical practical use here is that the fact that once you have done all of it and arrive at this linear equation, it's a linear equation in infinity for each i. So you you essentially only are interested in your input set right, for each unit. In other words, if you are talking about a large system, it scales each individual problem scales quadratically or high dimensional if you have third order interactive in uh, in the network size, but but you can still parallelize it in the sense that you can throw the problem to an independent block sparse solution solver uh, for each i. So you can divide it by n if you want. Uh, there are other questions from the Zoom audience. So I don't see. So, so, so. I have a few questions. So, so one what I would be really interested in is in these generating functions which which model the the interactions, right? So there you I mean have you no this no <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I know I know this type of question that there, there are lots of go ahead. So so what you showed us here were mostly pairwise interactions, right? And and sometimes three. Yeah, three. Yeah, three. <laughs> and so so I would of course, the question would be, is it possible to go a bit higher with, with these? And, and the other thing is, which I'm thinking, if we take another thing than, than the monomials you showed us, whether if you take spherical harmonics, or you take Chebyshev polynomials, or you take other things, whether you can go to a higher order. So, so and then, then, then this maybe makes the, on the other side, so the approach easier because you then, so, so you have, so you can put the nonlinearity in the generating functions more and then, Linearize the other things. Yeah. So uh, why I was so quick in, in answering no is that uh, I've I've heard about of the order of a hundred questions because there are so many ways you can do that go forward with yeah. this problem, and and any question which goes like have you done this is very likely to be no. <laughs> <laughs> Every question not, like you reformulate your question, can you do that? Yeah. Is probably yes because. But it's just a way, to make a way to do it, right? Yeah. If you are interested in a particular direction, you can almost certainly go. For example, um, for higher order, like if you have fifth order interactions, that should be feasible, as long as your dimensionality of C is not crazy big, right? Yes. If, if all the P's are very large, you yeah. need fifth order interactions, but all possibilities up to tenth order, you can imagine there are so many computations you can't, you can't do this. But, it only boils down to to um, distinguish between uh, different sets of coefficients in a certain in a certain way. For example, if you say, okay, only for this one or two or three variables, I assume there's a fifth order, and for the others, I know there's maximum two second order. Yeah. Then I I don't I can easily do that because fifth order for two variables, for, right? a fifth fifth order for hundred variables. Stupid. So that's a, that's why also very hard is to distinguish numerically can't take the course. Mm. I, I guess it's not my condition, is um, to distinguish between contributions of several different higher order terms which involve the same variables. Like for example, if you have fifth order and third order and second order for involving variables two and forty-two and possibly others. Then it's hard, right? If, if there are several terms, if there's x to the x to the uh, x, x five to the to the power of one and x uh, forty two to the power of seventeen, you take polynomials as your as your basis function, and then you have the same with x five and x forty two. But then in, in the, another monomial multiplied to that, it's hard to distinguish that because numerically it's, it shifts. I mean, it's not really. You know, my experience is not stable. Yeah, so I mean, this, this my, uh, if you take the canonical basis, then I'm, I'm, sh I'm I would say yes. So I mean, it's exactly you have the numerics are. Yeah. So you have to. I mean, somehow in the end, you have 
you know, somehow like like a regression problem on on the on the block, and, and you have to assign how to solve that with respect to the to the generating function you use there, and then and also like, exactly, yeah. and also it helps. Obviously, it helps if you know it's more information about the problem. So you may, for example, for this problem, you may not know the interaction function, but you know that these xi here are phase variables, right? It's oscillatory stuff. So what you want is Fourier basis. You know that. Here you know it, yeah. Because, and in other cases, you know other, other things. Exactly. For example, you don't know that these variables never have three-point interaction because they're repelling water. Um, yeah, so if you put in, yes, it's possible to do certain, to put in certain knowledge to, con to further constrain your problem and in this sense, make it uh, practically simpler. Mathematically, it's still the same class of complexity. Um, but because there's so many ways what, where you can make progress, I think it makes sense if you have a certain application in mind to go follow that one mm -hmm. direction like Arthur said. Okay, maybe one, one other question to so this nice example of the of the Trosovilla clock um, thing. So do you, this is really nice, and do you also have the real data for that or is it, no? Um, this simulate this, this, okay. It, how how they done? Other people mm -hmm. use the data to create this model. Yeah. Okay. We use the model to with move. with the parameters they used to run simulations of the model with noise and everything on the energies to determine this reconstruction. Yeah. But in principle, it. I mean, it, if the model is accurate, it should be the same thing, right? Yeah. In practice, it's never a good cause. Okay. They're different. For example, one common problem in these biological models is that different types of variables, or sometimes just different variables, may have vastly different uh, contributions from noise. Like one might be very, very deterministic, the other one might be dominated by noise. So you don't even see it. So you could model the entire variable as noise because it's just looking like this. And yeah, that's a, one of the problems I'm aware of. But in general, if the, mo I mean, if the data are roughly like the model, then it's fine. And also, you don't even need the model, right? We don't, we don't attempt to reconstruct this model. And we never had, for example, we never had these special nonlinearities, which are there, like the quotient nonlinearity, which they don't enter our analysis at all, and it still works fine. So just approximating roughly and just seeing what is better, right? It's not seeing what is absolutely great; it's just seeing which one is better. And again, we had, our question here was not to identify like the right hand side; it was only to identify the structure of the red, like which variables are influencing the other variables, essentially the graph, underlying graph. Is there yeah. one chat question or check? If there's something... No, it's just some comments. Where is it here? Oh, this is the first thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. So if there are no other questions from the Zoom audience, then I would say we, we close the seminar here. Thank you all, and we thank, of course, Mark again. <laughs>